Welcome you to our, our small workshop uh, today, uh, which is titled uh, Making Neighborhoods um, or Being Made by Neighborhoods. So uh, we're playing around uh, the neighborhood research um, um, and we are uh, very proud to have uh, George Galster here, uh, which will uh, present the keynote lecture, uh, Making Our Neighborhoods, Making Ourselves. Uh, George Galster was professor <laughs> at uh, Wayne University in uh, Detroit. Um, he is uh, a well-known researcher of neighborhood uh, research, neighborhood effects research, um, research on uh, um, yeah, relocation, um, um, on uh, yeah, all the stuff that uh, belongs to neighborhood research in uh, particular ways. Um, he told me two days ago that actually he is uh, e economic um, educated and not a social scientist, but uh, I guess most of the papers are very well received and also cited by social scientists and sociologists. Um, after the keynote, we have um, some further presentations uh, from colleagues of, uh, let's say, the area, the rural area. Um, we have um, uh, Heike Hahn first. Uh, there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Heike Hahn in uh, 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 Isabel um, uh, Ramos Lobato uh, will present uh, some of their research. We have uh, Susanne Frank <laughs> from the uh, uh, sorry uh, from um, the Institute Research Institute. Uh, how is it translated to regional and uh, urban <laughs> development? Um, <clears throat> yeah. We have uh, Susanne Frank from the uh, Technical University in Dortmund, uh, Sebastian Kottenbach uh, from the uh, Institute, no, not the Institute, the University of Applied Sciences uh, at uh, Münster, uh, and I will also present. Um, my name is Sören Petermann from the Ruhr University. Um, but first of all, the floor is yours, George, and we are. And we have a moderator. Oh yeah. Oh, sorry. I don't. No, no, no. It's it's fine by me. I just I just prepared a few words. Uh, very okay. very briefly. I don't want to. Uh, I, I was asked by Sebastian Kortenbach when I heard who would who would be, who would be here uh, at this workshop. Uh, I was very honored, and I uh, immediately said yes. Uh, I will do the the um, the moderation, and um, you basically said everything that I wanted to say. <laughs> I just wanted to add. Maybe a few sorry about that. No, 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 no worries. No worries. I just maybe wanted to add a few words uh, uh, to you, Mr. Galster, um, because um, your vita uh, and your illustrious academic career uh, might be a topic of its own workshop. Uh, when <laughs> looking uh, at it, uh, I found out that you that you have a CV which is 34 pages long. So uh, very, very illustrious career. One of the most distinguished academics on the issues of neighborhood neighborhood effects, um, and uh, as well as racial and uh, uh, racial discrimination and segregation, um, and the a, a brief overview of, of your station as an academic. Um, you said it after um, finishing your BA and BS in economics and organizational science. Um, George Galster received his PhD at the MIT in economics, um, and then later made his career in social science. Um, beginning at the Urban Institute in Washington, D.C. before joining Wayne State University in 1996. Uh, uh, he has published over 160 peer-reviewed journal articles, um, as well as several books as author, editor, and co-editor. Um, and as I said, and as you said, um, uh, Mr. Peterman, we're very happy to have you here today. And we're now, without further blabbing from my side, uh, please, uh, the, store, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for those. Thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome. Thank you for the lovely introductions. And it's an honor and a pleasure for me to be in Bochum for the first time. And I'm, I'm thrilled that you are here to, to talk about neighborhoods with me. Because as we will see in this seminar, they, they are crucial for our well-being and our life chances in many ways. What I'd like to do is, is to talk about a, a framework for what I hope will be interesting conversations this afternoon, and I'm going to take this framework from my recent book, Making Our Neighborhoods, Making Ourselves, 
And what I try to do is an overview of the general topics that this book contains, but then I like to bore down into some very particular claims that the book makes that I hope you will find interesting and, and most provocative in terms of its political implications. So what the book tries to do is, as was suggested, answer all sorts of basic questions about neighborhoods. What are they? How do we form expectations about the future of neighborhoods? Why are expectations crucial? Well, we know when we move into a neighborhood, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of expense. We don't want to move every other week. We want to move and stay there for a long period of time. So we want to see, is this going to be a good place to live, not only now, but years into the future? As an investor in property, the same applies. We want to see that our property appreciates in value over time, so the future of the neighborhood is just as important as the present of a neighborhood. But how do we find out what the future will be? How do neighborhoods change physically in terms of the composition of the buildings and the stores there? How does it change demographically in terms of the people who live there and economically in terms of the incomes of the people who live there? How do, in turn, neighborhoods shape us? Once we live in a place, the place starts to affect us. How does it affect the information we get about the world? How does it shape our behaviors? How does it shape our life opportunities? And those of our children. Then the policy-related questions. We know that in the United States and most of Western Europe, the marketplace and the forces of the market guide primarily what happens to our neighborhoods. Well, does the marketplace produce a pattern of neighborhoods that are efficient and equitable from a social perspective? Guess what? The answer is no. <laughs> I gave away the punchline, but you probably guessed it. And considering that the market doesn't always work optimally to get the best pattern of neighborhoods, the book talks about different kinds of public policies that local and regional and national planners and policymakers could use to try to improve what our neighborhoods look like. What I try to do in this book is to pull together wisdom about neighborhoods from a variety of social science disciplines which are listed here. And I try to take some core perspectives from each of them in this book. So from economics, I take the notion that markets are very important in our economies in terms of deciding a lot of things that happen. From sociology, I draw on the notion of social structure and how that shapes the way things happen. From geography, of course, I deal with space. Proximity is crucial to the story that I tell in this book. From planning, I take the notion of systems, interlocking patterns of causation, some of which are mutually reinforcing. And from psychology, I draw upon the notion of perception and how we filter the world in ways that shape our reality in important, important ways. So there's two basic themes in this book. And the first theme is, well, how do we act in ways that make neighborhoods? Where do they come from? Well, in a market-driven system, I argue in this book that basically our neighborhoods come about when you aggregate two flows, flows of people across space and flows of money across space. And of course, the two flows are interrelated. But we know that neighborhoods are made up of people, and so neighborhoods are shaped by how people make residential choices. Where do they decide to live? Based on a function of what they would like to get and what they can afford to get. Secondarily and related is investors' flows. How do investors choose where to buy property, where to sell property, where to redevelop new property? where to rehabilitate old property, where to abandon old property and let it be knocked down. 
Those decisions by investors determine how money flows across space. So those two flows of people and money across space make our neighborhoods, I would argue. But what determines these flows? The market, the price system. The price system, how residential areas are priced will determine who can afford to live where and will shape where investors put their money. It's as simple and as complex as that. Because, of course, all of these flows are interrelated with one another. If you choose to go to this neighborhood, you're not choosing to go to that neighborhood, which leaves a space for you to go to this neighborhood. Bah, 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 bah. Did you catch that social science that I just did? <laughs> that means it's too complicated for me to put into words. <laughs> and of course, as people are making moves, the investors are looking at that, and so they're putting money into different places, but as they put money into different places, people make different moves as a result of that. So it's a very, very complicated interactive system that we know markets <laughs> are. And of course, markets are regulated by governments. There are all sorts of rules, most of which are followed some of the time. Uh, but then there are other players that are important, and I don't want to minimize their role. We know that local governments invest in various ways that shape neighborhoods, such as by putting in a new tram line, building a new motorway, putting in a park. We also know that non-residential property owners, the owners of stores, shape the neighborhood environment. But my argument it developed in this book is that it's primarily the residential property market that is in the driver's seat when it comes to shaping neighborhoods. And these actors, though important, I think, are of secondary importance. So that's the summary of how we make our neighborhoods. Theme two is the book, talks about how neighborhoods make us. Once we live in a place, I would argue that that place has independent causal effects on many things in our lives. It shapes the information we get about the world because we learn about the world partially filtered through the neighborhoods, excuse me, the neighbors with whom we speak. They tell us about the world and what they tell us and what they emphasize is filtered through their own perceptions and their own values. Secondly, it affects our attitudes. How we think about our neighborhoods is colored by how our neighbors also think about our neighborhood and how they interact with us. It affects our perceptions of safety. It affects our physical and psychological health. Plenty of studies that show how air pollution or lead poisoning or perceived lack of safety have physical and psychological manifestations on you. It affects, obviously, your residential satisfaction. Satisfaction with your house and neighborhood are of great salience in all sorts of studies that look at overall life satisfaction, not surprisingly. It obviously affects your income. Where you live can affect your accessibility to employment. If you live in a place that has good internet service, it can affect how much money you can earn while working at home or whether you're even employed and can work at home. And if you're a property owner, it clearly will affect your wealth. And it can affect your behaviors. Not only adult behaviors are shaped by social norms in the neighborhood of what's acceptable behavior and what is unacceptable behavior, but especially children are malleable to peer pressures and role models that come about through the neighbor's with whom they play and what they see adults doing in the neighborhood. And those changes in childhood have been shown to have strong effects of later on activity related to how much education they get, what kind of work they will do if they work at all, whether they engage in criminal activity, when and how many children they have. Neighborhood effects affect a wide range of behaviors. And last but not least, because it shapes all of these characteristics of people, neighborhoods affect life chances. 
Neighborhoods literally are an important factor in shaping the path forward for especially youth. How they will turn out in all sorts of dimensions are influenced by the neighborhood. So we make neighborhoods, but once we live there, they start to make us. Now, what I try to do in the book is to put eight propositions that I believe are testable hypotheses, essentially. And I won't go through all of them today because that would take up our entire seminar. I will only focus on three highly interrelated ones to give you a flavor of the kinds of arguments that I make in the book. So first of all, I talk about threshold effects. And this proposition is as follows. Many basic neighborhood-related processes and phenomena do not proceed in a linear fashion, but rather in a non-linear fashion once critical values have been exceeded. In other words, if you were plotting a chart showing neighborhood change over time, where change is measured in whatever dimension you'd like, often these processes don't proceed as a straight line relationship. They proceed as a curve that generally could go up at an increasing rate or more often as a threshold point where nothing much is happening until you finally reach a point where certain critical mass is achieved and then things start to change rapidly. So this nonlinear change I think is quite typical of neighborhood dynamics and as we'll see it has very strong implications. The next principle is the inequity principle. I argue that primarily based on American and Western European evidence, but I'd be happy to think about the rest of the world if you'd like to give me some more information. I would argue that lower socioeconomic status and racial minority or ethnic minority households and property owners typically bear a disproportionate amount of the financial and social costs associated with neighborhood change while getting comparatively few benefits from that. Now the classic example is gentrification-based displacement, where lower-income households that may have been long-time residents in a lower-income community that may have very strong social ties and social bonds get displaced by the market who finds that that space can be occupied by higher-income people and the investors can earn much more money by changing the composition of that neighborhood. That kind of displacement is a classic example of where low-income people have their community bonds disrupted, they have to bear the cost of moving, yet they get none of the economic payoff from that. Those payoffs are reaped by higher income groups or higher income investors. That kind of process, I think, can be generalized. That's my second claim of the book. The last claim here today is about inefficiency. I'm arguing that the decision makers in neighborhoods, that is to say the households deciding where to move and the investors deciding where to put their money, will undertake a socially inefficient amount of these activities due to externalities, strategic gaming, and self-fulfilling prophecies. And this socially inefficient amount of housing will mean that ultimately we'll see too little investment in our housing stock and we'll have too much segregation of our people according to their income and often by their ethnicity. So those are the three claims I want to spend a little more time this afternoon amplifying and illustrating for you. I'm going to show how these three claims about threshold relationships equity relationships and inefficiency relationships relate to neighborhood household composition. In the book, I also talk about how they relate to the investment patterns. Today, I'm just going to focus on the household side of things in terms of where people live. And I'm going to argue that the spatial distribution of income groups is inefficient and inequitable for society as a whole. To put it a little more pointedly, I'm arguing that Adam Smith, who's argued about the 
unfettered marketplace leading to socially optimal out outcomes, as if guided by an invisible hand. You may recall that quote from The Wealth of Nations. It's by my bedside. I'm sure it's by yours as well. <laughs> he argued, and it has influenced most economists for centuries since, that you can count on the market and everybody doing what's best for themselves, leading to the best outcome for all of us together. Well, I go, sorry, Adam, you didn't get it right when it comes to neighborhoods. The market doesn't get you to a desirable optimum situation when everybody's decisions are aggregated. So here is why I argue that. Now, the inefficiency that I'm talking about is a special kind, and I need to make sure you understand it before I go further. I'm talking about what is known to economists as Pareto improvements. Now that's a situation where one person in society is made better off and no other person in society is made worse off. So if you are my society, all of you people here together are a little illustrative society. And if the market or the government or whomever makes Sebastian better off, according to his own assessment, and, and by doing so, you are not made worse off, that is an unambiguous gain to society. Because when we add up everybody's happiness, we'll get a little bump up because you're all the same in terms of happiness, and you're a little happier now. Right? Everybody see how that's an overall improvement to society? We don't have to make any judgments about whether he's worthy <laughs> or whether you're unworthy, but if you aren't affected and one person is made better from this perspective, that's a better thing. Okay? So that's my view of efficiency. If we can do that, if we, we can make one person better off without harming anybody else, that's more efficient. Because we're trying, it's like a utilitarian, we're trying to get the greatest good for the greatest number. That's my ultimate goal here. Second thing I'm arguing is the market doesn't do that when it comes to neighborhoods due to externalities. Another fancy word. What's an externality? It is an indirect cost or benefit that arises through the decisions and behaviors of one person, but those costs and benefits aren't accrued to that one person who is making the decision. So, an illustration. If one of you, let's say Zurin, decides that he wants to let his house deteriorate, nothing personal, <laughs> <laughs> he is making that decision based on his own household's circumstances. Your finances, your preferences, your priorities for how do you want to spend your budget. It's a private decision to that household, but that decision of letting his house get really ugly affects all of you as neighbors who have to look at this dump every single day. <laughs> That's a negative externality because in making this decision of whether to let the house deteriorate or not, Zorin did not consider all of the negative effects it would have on his neighbors unless he's an incredibly altruistic swell person, <laughs> which I'm sure you are, but some in the market economy are not. A lot of the decisions related to neighborhood, how to take care of your property, whether to engage in antisocial activities, da -da 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 -da, are typically made in a sort of self-centered way, not thinking about what it means for the collective neighborhood well-being. That's an externality and happens all the time regarding neighborhoods because things are so close together. Secondly, though, I'm arguing that income groups in the neighborhood create a special kind of externality, a nonlinear externality by their presence through a variety of causal mechanisms. Now, this is a complicated one that takes a little unpacking. I'm arguing, first of all, that when a person of a particular income group, high, middle, low, I don't care, but if that person presence in the neighborhood shapes how other people probably well, other people feel about the neighborhood because they think, oh, 
it's good that you're moving into the neighborhood because you have this income, or they could think, oh, it's bad for the neighborhood because you have that income. You are creating an externality without intending to do it. But your mere fact that you're of a certain social status can be read by your neighbors as a good thing or a bad thing, depending on the class of your neighbors, probably. Right? Can you kind of buy that one? Because at least in America, <laughs> well, in any consumer society, we are what we consume, right? We're, we're told at a very early age that our identity is tied up with what we consume. So what we wear, what we drive, and where we live says a lot about us, right? So if we're interested in our status and somebody of a lower status moves in next door, what does that say about us? <laughs> so the status of your neighbors probably matters to a lot of people. Now, that's the notion of an externality, non-linear. What I'm arguing here is that probably just one person of this hypothetical social group moving in isn't going to change your feeling about the neighborhood much. But what if five of them move in? Ooh, now things might get a little really good or really bad. I'm arguing that from a social perspective standpoint, a token member of a group that's different from you in your neighborhood probably isn't going to change your perceptions or expectations or satisfaction much. But past some critical threshold, you're probably going to start to feel the difference, sense the difference, for good or for bad. That's a nonlinear or threshold kind of externality. The externality doesn't start with the first person, probably not the second person, but at some point, that one extra person starts to make the rest of the neighborhood feel different, for better or for worse. Okay, now, this long explanation about nonlinear externalities related to income composition isn't just random theorizing, because I like to theorize. No, it's a crucial, crucial assumption to this next proposition of inefficiency. Because I'm going to, the only way you can make the argument that you can improve some people's well-being in some neighborhoods without harming the people's well-being in any other neighborhoods is if the externalities associated with the income composition of neighborhoods is triggered by a threshold concentration, not if it's simply a linear kind of externality. So in other words, to have threshold externalities related to income composition of neighborhoods is a necessary condition to claim that the current pattern of income across neighborhoods is inefficient. Now that's not self-explanatory, so let me try to work through that. So, let me work through some thought experiments. Uh, I have to confess, not only am I a recovering economist, I'm a recovering physicist. That was my undergraduate degree. But I still have some, some residual issues with that, and one of them is I love thought experiments. So forgive me. I'm not completely recovered from my mind. So thought experiment one here. Let's, let's, what we're going to do with these thought experiments is consider different kinds of how this externality could work in terms of people moving into your neighborhood. And I'm going to try to keep this generic by saying it's income group X. So I'm trying to be general here. I'm not talking about low income people or high income people. It's just any generic group. Now, let's imagine in this first thought experiment that each member of group X generates either a positive or negative amount of externality for her neighbors but it's constant. That is to say, the first person in group X or the first household in group X who moves in will generate this fixed amount of good or bad stuff for the neighborhood. The second household of group X that moves in will generate another amount of good or bad stuff, the equal amount that the first per household generated, and so on. That's what I mean by a fixed amount. That's, that's a linear exter externality. Well, then the conclusion you reach about efficiency is this one. 
you would have to conclude that under those circumstances, all distributions, why? Because any transfer of a person or a household from group X between neighborhoods is zero sum. Meaning that if we take one, if you're person X, so we take you from this neighborhood and you are doing a good thing for this neighborhood, and we take you and put you in this neighborhood, this neighborhood gains by that fixed amount, but this neighborhood loses by that fixed amount. So we have not made a Pareto improvement. We've improved this neighborhood, but we've hurt that neighborhood, and that washes it out. That's not a more efficient distribution. So if every person or household associated with Group X has this kind of fixed quantity of externality, good or bad, we can't argue that there's any efficiency implications of whether all the Group X people live in one neighborhood or whether they're equally sprinkled across all neighborhoods. It shouldn't make any difference from the perspective of social well-being. Now, let's do a different thought experiment. What if the person of Group X now generates a positive externality for all in the neighborhood, but only past a certain threshold percentage? Meaning, what if all of these externalities, these good things for neighbors, don't start until you get at least 25%, I'm making this up, 25% of the neighborhood has to become members of group X before the 26% starts to create a positive externality. Now, under those circumstances, can you intuit where I'm going? How should we distribute people X across our various neighborhoods? to improve some neighborhoods without hurting other neighborhoods. Got any suggestions for me? Well, let me just work through some alternatives for you. Uh, should we evenly sprinkle group X across space? Or should we concentrate all of group X in segregated, completely segregated communities, all X? Or should we try to distribute X so that in many neighborhoods as possible, we get them over the threshold point concentration. Yeah, you're nodding, it's the last one. <laughs> yeah, good. I'm glad I saw some yeses, because if, if I saw this, I realized, oh, I'm not communicating well. <laughs> so, yes, here is where we're going. You try to distribute, or you minimize the number of X living in concentrations below the threshold point, because they're essentially being wasted. They're too thinly spread to create positive externalities for their neighbors, so they're being wasted, so to speak, from a social perspective. Let's at least concentrate them enough so they start doing good things for their neighbors. So that would be the most socially efficient allocation that way. Mm -hmm. The next type of experiment is the opposite. What if it's a negative externality for neighbors that starts to occur past the threshold? The implication here is, for efficiency points, we want to distribute them where we minimize the number of people living in concentrations above the threshold. Because below the threshold, they're not doing any harm to their neighbors. Above the threshold is when they start to do harm. So let's make sure that happens as rarely as we possibly can. All right, now, this is such a key part of my argument that I want to do a little illustration in a way that I think will bring it home. The illustration is very simple. It's, it's almost anthropological. I'm the play anthropologist here and do some participant observation. This is two, <laughs> this is two neighborhoods, okay? One neighborhood. Now, to make this work, uh, I'm going to be a member of Group X. And Group X is the blue hat group. <laughs> Now, let's imagine that I am giving off negative externalities of a fixed amount. Uh, I'm just maybe an inherently bad person. I'm not sure what it is, but let's just assume that I'm, I'm always going to give off bad vibes to my neighbors. Doesn't matter where I am, I'm just, I have a quantum of badness, is what I'm talking about. That's just who I am. Now, suppose the world makes me start up this neighborhood. Now, from a social efficiency standpoint, can I make our world, consisting of these two neighborhoods, more efficient by moving me over here? 
I want to see heads showing yes or no here. Come on. No. Okay, correct. Because <laughs> I didn't see your head. <laughs> Because when I left this neighborhood, I made it better off, right? Because they no longer have to put up with me. <laughs> but when I went into this neighborhood, I made them worse off because now I'm their neighbor. Did we make a Pareto improvement to society? No. This neighborhood gained, but this neighborhood lost. In my view, that's not a guaranteed efficiency improvement. To, to argue that that would be more efficient would force us to make judgment calls about the worth of the neighbors here versus the worth of the neighbors here, and I don't want to go there. Okay, so that's the first situation. The second situation is the threshold situation, and I need two helpers to show me this. Thank you very much, Sebastian. <laughs> they didn't know they were going to get to this. <laughs> Aha! Aha! Now the gang's all here. <laughs> now the blue hats have a different thought experiment. This is the situation of a threshold point. Now, in this thought experiment, the blue hats only start causing problems for their neighbors if they exceed three per neighborhood. Anything less than three per neighborhood, no negative externalities. All right? Okay, so let's play the thought experiment. Come here, laddie. Let's imagine that all three of us are in this neighborhood. Are we past the threshold point for this neighborhood? Yes. So we are starting to generate bad stuff for this neighborhood. With me? Okay. Would it be an improvement for social well-being as a whole if for whatever reason, Sebastian moved out of this neighborhood and was in this neighborhood? Yes. Would we make this neighborhood better off? Yes, because we're below the threshold. And now, we're not so bad anymore. <laughs> because, you know, it takes three to party. And we, just, no offense, but I... Yeah. <laughs> but do we make this neighborhood worse off? No, because he's not bad either. So we made one neighborhood... Well... <laughs> I can say it's a thought experiment. <laughs> We made one neighborhood better off. We did not make another neighborhood worse off. Pareto improvement. You see how that could be efficient. So what I try to demonstrate, thank you, gentlemen, is that if there's a fixed quantity of externalities associated with the income mix of a neighborhood, that every member of group X generates a positive or negative thing for their neighbors, then we can't make any claims that we can do better than what the market does in putting income groups together across space. But, like in the second case, if there are threshold effects associated with income groups concentrations, then it is possible to think about rearranging people in space that could be Pareto improving that would improve social efficiency. Okay, Whew. I'm finally done with that argument and you're probably going, <laughs> Okay, now, evidence. So far, it's just been thought experiments. Let me give you some actual evidence. This is from the United States, and I really wish someone would replicate this in a Western European context, because I think it would be very interesting. This is the evidence from the United States. There's been a series of statistical studies, and I could tell you about the details of the statistical studies, but I won't, because statistics prove that after about five minutes of talking about statistics, 23% of the group is sleeping. And statistics prove that after 10 minutes of talking about statistics, 55% of the room is sleeping. And after 15 minutes of talking about statistics, I'm sleeping. So I'm not going to talk about statistics. I am going to briefly summarize that these statistical models used neighborhood poverty rates as the key explanatory variable for outcomes that range, depending on the study, from criminal propensity to dropping out of school to having children as a teenager, all sorts of things that we probably agree are not good for society. And a variety of studies with a variety of samples, a variety of variables, came to amazingly consistent conclusions. And that was that as the proportion of poverty in a neighborhood is, is below 15-20%. There's virtually no relationship 
between changes in poverty in that range and any kind of outcome. It just doesn't seem to matter in terms of the propensity for individuals living in that neighborhood to do behaviors that society doesn't like. However, past about 20%, 25% poverty rates, then when neighborhood concentrations of poverty exceed that threshold, the rate at which individuals in those neighborhoods start to engage in these problematic behaviors goes up dramatically. And also interestingly, if it gets past about 40%, there isn't any relationship thereafter. So in other words, it's about as bad as it's gonna get. <laughs> and further increases in concentration poverty uh, don't seem to cause much. Now, to give you some context here, American poverty, in terms of that word, uh, is really low income. Uh, currently, it's about $25,000 US per year for a family of four. So if you earn less than that, you are officially considered poor. So by European standards, I generally get the impression that that's really poor. Uh, you know, 20,000 euros, roughly. Anyway, so that's one piece of evidence. There's another piece of evidence that I've done in some of my earlier work to, as well, which looks at the relationship between neighbor, neighborhood poverty and the property market. Looking at changes in housing prices, changes in rents for apartments. Again, a very similar picture just flipped on its head that once the poverty rate in a neighborhood exceeds about 15, 20%, the market starts to drop in value, which is consistent with the idea that bad things are starting to happen in this neighborhood. And the property market is saying, and the future of this neighborhood doesn't look too great either. And so disinvestment starts to happen. Both of these pieces of information support the thought experiment that we did with my two blue-hatted friends here. <laughs> that an over-concentration of low-income people leads to bad social consequences. What kind of numbers am I talking about? Well, here <laughs> we could do another thought experiment. Uh, Taking the parameters from that previous picture about how property values change when poverty rates in the neighborhood change, you can work through the numbers for the 100 largest metro areas in the United States. And the thought experiment you could play is as follows. You can see what happens if we played God and we simply said, hypothetically, any neighborhood that has more than 20% poor people in them will lift up and move out enough poor people such that the poverty rate will just be down to 20%. And what will we do with these people, hypothetically? We would drop them into the lowest poverty census tracts, where there's the least low-income people today, until the poverty rate in those destination neighborhoods moved up by five percentage points. So if it started 1% poverty, in this thought experiment, it would end up at 6% poverty. Okay? Now, if you do this thought experiment, it ends, ends up being the case that there are no neighborhoods that would receive so many low-income people that it would push it over the threshold. Because the national poverty rate is only about 13 to 14% right now in the United States. And remember, the thresholds were around 20%. So if we literally could move people out of concentrated poverty down to 20% poverty neighborhoods, and put them in low poverty neighborhoods, all those low poverty neighborhoods would still stay below the threshold point. And thus, <laughs> you can see what would happen here. We've made some neighborhoods better off by reducing the poverty rate down to the threshold. We haven't made any neighborhoods worse off because they've only gained a few low income people below the threshold concentration. So there's actually a net gain to society as a whole. How much money am I talking about? Well, the annual value of the owner-occupied stock in the United States would go up 13% in the biggest 100 metro areas, and the aggregate value of the rental housing stock would rise 4%. Ah, percentages, percentages, what does that mean? Oh, roughly a trillion US dollars. <laughs> now, I know if you're Elon Musk, that's nothing. <laughs> For most of us, that's a pretty big number. 
looking at that coin on the other side, pardon the pun, uh, it suggests that the way we're letting the market allocate people across, allocate low-income people across space in the United States is costing the U.S. dearly. And this is only one way to measure the cost. I mean, it doesn't even count the, the health, the crime, the educational costs of the behaviors that are being reflected behind those numbers. So I'm talking about a big deal is what I'm trying to say. It's not, it's not just an academic point. We're talking about serious money here. <laughs> just, just to remind you, you know, that the biggest infrastructure bill that the United States ever passed earlier in the Biden administration was about a trillion dollars. So it's not trivial money is what I'm trying to say. Okay. So that's the first rationale for intervention, the efficiency rationale. We have too many concentrations of poverty in the United States. The market is leading to too much concentrated poverty to be socially efficient. The second argument that we should worry about is that low-income households are being treated unfairly by the market. They get the worst residential environments, however you want to measure it in terms of pollution, in terms of institutional supports and social services, uh, social conditions, economic conditions, public safety conditions, all sorts of measures are very class dependent in the United States statistics. They also bear the most involuntary residential mobility. They are most often evicted. They most often have to move because their house is unlivable, either due to fire or safety problems or vermin infestations. Typically as well, home appreciation, residential property goes up in value less the greater the poverty concentration in the neighborhood. So all of this means, essentially, from an equity standpoint, that we're creating a series of neighborhoods in the United States where we have unequal opportunities. Remember, neighborhood affects us in a variety of ways, but most importantly, it affects the developmental context of children. We know that the Neighborhood context independently affects life courses of children, independent of what their parental background is. Of course parental background is important, but the neighborhood in which they live is also important. So, if we know that the neighborhood context in which American children are growing up are incredibly unequal, and we know that there's those contexts affects how children will or will not succeed, then by designing unequal neighborhoods, we are creating unequal opportunities for social advancement. So I'm arguing essentially that neighborhoods are a primary engine that drives inequality in the United States and drives wasted resources that could be spent in a lot more valuable ways than what we currently do from the market situation. So what does this imply for public policy? I argue that there is a compelling case on the grounds of both Pareto efficiency, business people, hear that, and distributional equity, social justice advocates, hear that. <laughs> Either trumpet that you want to listen to, I don't care, you get to the same place, there should be some kind of public intervention that changes the market outcomes in ways so we get less concentration of disadvantaged households in particular neighborhoods. And I make similar arguments in the book about ethnic concentrations uh, and how the market that invests in property, of course, follows on the distribution of people in space to distribute economic resources and investment resources unequally across space that reinforces the concentration of people across space. So I'm not arguing that simply shifting people around in and of itself is a solution for poverty. No, that's got to go a lot farther than that, but I'm arguing that it's a crucial component of a multi-pronged set of policies that will, over the long term, reduce poverty and inequality by producing a more equal structure for the next generation to develop in. So, to summarize what I've tried to argue this, this afternoon, is we make our neighborhoods by market-driven processes that guide financial and human flows across space through price signals. And these decisions by individual property owners and households are essentially designed to make those entities best off from their narrowly defined definition of, of being best off. But 
that is going to be inefficient, as we're going to see. Secondly, though, once we have people in neighborhoods, we know that they shape us in a variety of ways that I've already outlined. And therefore, it's because the current market-driven system of making our neighborhoods is essentially broken, it's both socially inefficient and socially inequitable, I would argue that enlightened self-interest and fairness both demand that we have good neighborhood policy and planning. So what am I trying to aim for? I'm trying to aim for a neighborhood policy that's essentially about as American as it gets because we're talking about equal opportunity. One of the pillars of American symbolism, ethos, mythos, is equal opportunity. So right now, unfortunately, equal opportunity is a sham. What we're arguing for in this book is to transform equal opportunity from a hollow promise into a hallowed premise. <laughs> and thank you very much for your question. <laughs> Afterwards, <laughs> do, you, do you want to change off the computer for the next uh, presentation? Yeah, yeah. I, I assume we can do oh, questions at the question end. Question answers for you now, and then we make a short break. Okay, fine. Let's do that. Questions for me now. Does someone want to moderate this, or do you want to let me do it? Please. Sir. So, I, I think. Thank you for. Uh, uh, for uh, thank you for the presentation. I wonder that one thing maybe is missing. One study from HIP about collective efficacy shows one thing. If there is a bad guy in the neighborhood with a blue hat on, right, you can remember, is doing bad things in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. What happened is that people in the neighborhood learn that nobody stand up against that him. Even if this guy moved to another, um, another neighborhood, the neighborhood doesn't recover because they learned that nobody does anything against that. So this bad influence stay at the neighborhood. Even the guy moved away. Yeah. In your experiment, that's not the case. So the perspective of mm -hmm. social learning, yeah. the social learning theory yeah. is missing. It's a, yeah, please. So the, yeah. the question is, yep. how, um, how could we integrate this classical social, um, social psychological approach in your explanation about neighborhood effects? Okay. The one of the classic arguments of why there may be this threshold effect, this negative threshold externality effect represented by the blue hat phenomenon, is that if there are few blue hats in the neighborhood, the collective, collective efficacy of the neighborhood or the, the dominant neighborhood norms would be powerful enough to suppress those bad behaviors. But when that critical mass of the blue hats exceeds the capacity of the neighborhood to enforce collective norms, that's when things start to get bad. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if literally HIP found that one person was sufficient to erode collective efficacy, then that is counter evidence to the story I made. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it's even more complicated if indeed neighbors or a neighborhood collectively learns from past experience with certain compositions about what the future is likely to be. And those dynamics get really complicated because those people may not stay in the future to be part of the new collective efficacy. As eroded as that might be, they might choose to move out and find a place where there is still collective efficacy and, and norms that enforce civil behaviors. Mm -hmm. And when that residential instability is a consequence mm -hmm. of past social learning, then that 
also complicates this story dramatically. So, yes, it it certainly is a a story that has many caveats, and I appreciate that caveat too. But it also has another area of political intervention, if I could call it that, with which I know you're familiar, and that's neighborhood organizing. I mean, neighborhood neighborhood collective efficacy is not a fixed thing. It, it's malleable. It can be intervened in in a way to make it stronger. And so public policy I'm talking about here isn't, isn't simply moving people around like they're pieces on a chessboard. It, it's working at the neighborhood level to, to work on these social dynamics in a way that allows this potential gain of efficiency. Some neighborhoods gain and other neighborhoods don't lose to make that a reality. So thank you for correctly uh, complicating the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my job. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely right. Other great questions that I cannot answer. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. I mean, there is this big question as to whether it would expand uh, the context effects you are you for in, in the U.S. American context also is, uh, uh, is reflected in, in European contexts and uh, both regarding the different welfare systems yep. as well as w what is a neighborhood so it's about the scale and, and uh, context of neighborhood. So I was wondering about your, um, yeah, your feedback on that. And then also about, for example, I mean, we had some discussions about action spaces. So is it really the neighborhood, but or is it rather the setting where people interact? So it's not just the living in a specific neighborhood, but the question, do I maybe choose a school outside that neighborhood or my workplace? So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm curious to, to learn more two, about that. Two important questions. Thank you for those. First of all, the cross-national cross-cultural context is very important. And I, I don't believe that all these arguments that I made can be easily picked up and dropped into Western European uh, or Northern European social welfare states. My guess would be uh, that when you have a more comprehensive set of generalized welfare supports, when you have a system where public education is more controlled by central governments, and, so, and thus there's more equality of educational facilities across space. Uh, a system where there's probably better job training, better support when you're unemployed, better opportunities for addiction treatment, better opportunities in every dimension of social structure, that this threshold point that I identified for American poverty neighborhoods is very different and I would, I would suspect, if not, not as strong, not as dramatic, and probably at a much higher concentration of, of disadvantaged people than it is in the United States. I, I'm, I'm guessing that that's the situation. That's why I said I would, I would truly like to see more statistical studies that test whether there is a similar kind of concentration effect in European context, because as I'm sure you know, politically the issue of social mix of neighborhoods is much hotter politically in Europe than it is in the United States. It's completely off the discussion in the United States. Nobody's talking about po poverty concentration except if you're in an academic conference. No political party is talking about that at all. So ironically, where it needs to be talked about, it's not being talked about. So that's how I would respond to the first part of your question. The second part about whether it's neighborhood or broader social or physical context that do the power of the neighborhood effect, that, <laughs> sorry, the answer is it depends. And, <laughs> and it depends on, isn't that a terrible academic response? We do it all the time, but I mean, it's, it's really correct in this case. Uh, it depends on what mechanism of context you're talking about. So, if it's the mechanism of how the context is affecting you and it's working through environmental things like air pollution and lead pollution, then yes, your, your action space, your routine activity space is probably what should be measured to see how much pollution you're being exposed to on a daily basis. If 
the mechanism is conforming to social norms, then it might be of people that you would want to measure with whom you interact and who are significant others in shaping your normative and social world that would be the right thing to measure. If it's institutional mechanisms of neighborhood effects, such in the United States, because you're living here, you must go to this school, and this school is terrible, let's say. If that's the neighborhood effect, then it's the school catchment area, which is the appropriate neighborhood to measure. So that's why I think the answer depends on which aspect of neighborhood effect mechanism you're speaking about. Because in the book, I, I actually define neighborhood as this, uh, now I realize I shouldn't have written it this way. It's a Russian doll. <laughs> politically incorrect, politically incorrect. It's a Russian doll in the sense that there's nested spaces around where you live. There's, there's an immediate block face where there's certain levels of socialization that take place. That's the smallest spatial scale. Then there's another spatial scale that might correspond to some administrative districts in which other aspects of your context shape you. There's perhaps a bigger spatial scale where it's the air quality of the region that shapes you. So there's all sorts of spatially nested contexts that affect you. And which one you want to call neighborhood and which one you want to call something else is completely arbitrary and I ultimately don't care. <laughs> but, but, I, but space at various scales does affect us. I absolutely believe that. And so I'll stop before I get into more politically incorrect <laughs> Other great questions. Other mediocre questions. I'll take them all, please, <laughs> don't be shy. Yes, please. Just a question, because of your research for the book and of the years past, you've pointed out the reallocation of people who would be beneficial to the society. Have you seen different welfare systems, different countries where even on a small scale this has been done, where investors have been found to invest in a better neighborhood for social housing or the likes to get poorer people to move in? Has Just give us a bright <laughs> outlook here. Is sure. It possible? Well, believe it or not, I'll, I'll take the hardest situation to deal with. That's the United States. Yeah. Um, there have been a good deal of experiments where low-income people who originally were living in extremely poverty-concentrated social housing projects in terrible neighborhoods, big multi-story high-rise buildings, uh, were helped to move to low-poverty neighborhoods. Uh, by the way, I should mention that, that these folks involved uh, were almost all African-American, low-income families. They were helped moved to low poverty and much less racially concentrated neighborhoods in terms of black populations through a variety of services provided by local counseling agencies that essentially helped them think about the social implications of moving to a very different kind of neighborhood than they're previously been exposed to real estate type agents who would help them actually locate landlords who are willing to rent apartments to them, federal supports with rental subsidies so that what they can afford to pay and what the actual rent is in these destination neighborhoods is filled in by the subsidy so they can afford to live in a decent neighborhood. And all of those pieces match together with social support after they move, uh, often taking the form of a used automobile because their social networks are perhaps now spatially more distant than they used to be. And the American tra public transportation system is, is well known for its inadequacies. So you need that car perhaps. So all of these things together have produced some extremely positive outcomes for the families that have moved. And depending on the circumstance, uh, of what happens in the neighborhoods afterwards. Sometimes, indeed, the market has come in and big time redeveloped those neighborhoods. Uh, Chicago is a classic example of where masses of public housing, the worst concentration of poverty ever in the United States, were knocked down. People were helped to move, sometimes with not all those supports that I described, uh, to move to better neighborhoods, the original residents. Then those places were redeveloped with mixed income housing developments that have a mixture of market rate de developments, 
sort of modest rate, uh, market rate apartments and actual public housing to serve the poorest of the poor back on the same site. So there are illustrations of how that can be a win-win situation, just like I was talking about, Pareto improvements. And yet it takes a lot of public money and a lot of committed agencies from a variety of dimensions to make this thing work. And as you know, right now at the national level, we're pretty paralyzed in terms of accomplishing any of that as a national policy. So at the local scale, we've seen, I think, some good prototypes of how it could be done, but we've yet to adopt that at a scale where it's going to make much difference, frankly, in my nation. Please. Yeah, well, I would say uh, neighborhood effects are crucial to your argument, and if you, if you would like to measure uh, neighborhood effects in a quantitative way, uh, neighborhood effects are mostly like a black box. We have some thinking about neighborhood effects, maybe uh, bad resources in the neighborhood, uh, social learning or stigmatization or something. And uh, what do you think? What are the, what are the crucial impacts of, uh, which, with regard to neighborhood effects? Are there some studies who can uh, say something about the quantity, quantity of these effects? Not to the extent that I think we both want, which is to, to say which kind of neighborhood effect mechanism is really carrying the power here. No. The, typically, it's been qualitative studies that have looked at social relationships. Quantitative studies that might measure the impact of air pollution, but that's not related to the relative impact of the other mechanisms. It's all been very piecemeal. And I've never found a, a study that, or a combination of studies that has tried to synthesize or create a holistic study that could indeed tease out which mechanism is really carrying the power of the, na the neighborhood effect. And part of the complication is that, as I mentioned in responding to your question, there isn't just one neighborhood. Yeah. There's oh. multiple scales of where the effects and the mechanisms might emanate. Mm -hmm. And so, plus, then there's the context effects. We know that whatever the mechanism is, it will not have equal effects on everybody who lives there. Effects are gendered. They have a class dimension. They have an ethnicity dimension in terms of what is going to affect whom most. Mm -hmm. um, neighborhood effects are, <laughs> we're talking about context effects, and ironically, context effects are context dependent, which seems <laughs> ironic, but that I think is the truth. There's just so much heterogeneity that has to be thought about, both in the mechanism of the effect, the scale of the effect, the, the heterogeneous effects on the people, depending on the people's characteristics, that is, it's easier to understand if it's just a black box. Because if you open the box up, you don't know what's going to fly out, and it may not be pretty. So it, it's a fascinating area that needs so much more work. Um, all I think I can say with confidence is they matter. <laughs> to, to a lot of important people at a lot of important stages in their life. And, and so I truly believe the evidence is compelling that, that life course of children especially ha has important elements of context effects. Right from the very beginning, if, if a child is born in an area where there's a lot of lead poisoning, we know there's permanent damage that can happen to that child. Neurodevelopment. And, so we know from the very earliest ages that context can matter for somebody's life course. And then it just gets, you layer that on year after year after year with other kinds of mechanisms and path dependency we know. So it may be a black box, but I think we know enough about pieces of that black box to make some intelligent public policy. At least in my nation, we haven't had the political will, for whatever reason, to do that. Thank you, Mr. Gerster. I'm sure. sorry to break up the discussion. Unfortunately, <laughs> as, as moderator, it falls yeah, yeah. upon my own <laughs> yeah, yeah. to do so. Uh, sure. Thank you very much. I think sure. we have a lot to take away, also to bring hats and not talk, about, talk too much about statistics in our seminars. <laughs> um, one thing to just get it out of the way, uh, yes. because I forgot to introduce myself, I will do that very briefly because I'm obviously the least knowledgeable person you will hear talk today. My name is Jan Rees. I'm a researcher at EKG in Bielefeld and University of Applied Sciences, uh, alongside Sebastian and other colleagues that are here. Um, right now, 
uh, we will make a short break of 15, 15 minutes, that is, because we will have four different beautiful uh, presentations, and uh, we will have all of these four uh, presentations right after one another, and then uh, have a big discussion round in the end, and maybe we can come back to some of the black boxes that we've sure. uh, been discussing today. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah.